Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Ware and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today to this special event on Francis Bacon, Philosophy and Psychoanalysis. Today's event is a collaboration between the estate of Francis Bacon and the Centre for Philosophy and Art here at King's. The Centre's aim is to work hand in hand with leading artists, galleries and art institutions to explore questions at the cutting edge of contemporary theory and the arts. And so we're absolutely delighted and honoured on this particular occasion to be able to partner with the estate of Francis Bacon and to further research into one of the most important British artists of the 20th century. I'd like to start by extending special thanks to Martin Harrison, Ben Harrison, and Elizabeth Beattie at the Bacon Estate for making today's event possible, and also to my colleagues at the Centre for Philosophy and Art, especially the Centre's co-directors, Sasha Golob and Vanessa Brassi. So why Bacon philosophy and psychoanalysis now? Why this particular encounter or re-encounter with art and theory today? The inspiration for this conference was less an academic question and more a sense of frustration or puzzlement. Why is it that so many critics writing about Bacon today begin with exactly the same set of ideas and concepts? These ideas derive from statements which Bacon himself makes about his work. Specifically in his famous interviews with the critic David Sylvester, Bacon claims that the aim of his paintings is to make a violent impact upon the spectator's nervous system, eliminating what he calls the narrative or illustrative aspect of the image. The works, Bacon says, seek to unlock sensation, to provoke a convulsive shudder in those who encounter them. It is precisely these ideas that are taken up by Gilles Deleuze in his 1981 book on Bacon, where Deleuze argues that what directly interests Bacon is a violence that is involved only with colour and line, the violence of a sensation. So Bacon and Deleuze then both inherit a particular strand of modernist aesthetic thought one that evaluates the work of art in terms of its capacity to generate bodily or affective experiences. But this emphasis on sensation and affect turns out to be highly problematic, not least because, as Hegel already reminds us in his lectures on aesthetics, the investigation of the feelings which art evokes or is supposed to evoke does not get us beyond vagueness. In relation to Bacon then, we might say that by assigning primacy to the beholder's singular emotional response, we get no sense of what it is that the paintings actually mean, or indeed might mean, or what it is that actually compels our continuing interest in them. And so this is precisely where I think philosophy and psychoanalysis need to re-enter the frame. Just as Bacon once remarked that the essence or truth of a subject can only be found in the distorted recording of its appearance, so we might propose that it is only through the radical distortions of philosophy and psychoanalysis that we can arrive at any truth regarding Bacon's art today. It is high time then to open up a new dossier on Bacon, one that allows us to see his work in radically new and unexpected ways, forcing us to think again about what philosophy and psychoanalysis mean for art and what art means for philosophy and psychoanalysis. I have no doubt that this is precisely what we'll succeed in working towards today. And on this note, Let's begin. OK, so I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker for today, uh, Darren Ambrose. Darren is a theorist, editor and artist represented by the Tower House Gallery in Northumberland, 
He is the author of film, Nihilism and the Restoration of Belief with Zero Books, and most recently the editor of K-Punk, the collected and unpublished writings of Mark Fisher. Darren's many published essays have focused on the relationship between philosophy, critical theory and aesthetics, and today he will speak to us on the topic of Bacon's Corpus. Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ben. Um, ben originally invited me to this conference uh, back before the pandemic, and I think um, at that point I, I'd been planning to come and give a, a paper on Deleuze's book on Bacon, The Logic of Sensation, which is a work I've written a fair amount about. Um, and I was specifically going to speak about the idea of the diagram um, in, in Deleuze. But actually, uh, sort of since the pandemic, as many things have, uh, things have changed. And today I'm planning to speak much more about the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy um, rather than Deleuze. And that decision is governed in part, I think, by my belief, something sort of Ben touched on at the uh, beginning here, is that, um, that Del first of all, that Deleuze's account, I think, of the diagram is somewhat flawed. Um, but it's also my belief that his work on Bacon as a whole has become somewhat over-familiar and has ended up framing or trapping Bacon's work within a set of well-trodden, and dare I say it now, cliched ideas. Whilst retaining considerable resources for thinking Bacon's work on its own terms, or often in its own terms, i.e. Bacon's own terms, Deleuze's book undoubtedly contains much that risks reducing Bacon's actual paintings to accompanying illustrations to Deleuze's own conceptual apparatus, um, which is composed itself of a series of borrowed, inherited and created concepts, which are then fairly systematically applied to Bacon's entire work up until 1981, when the book was originally published. As I've argued before, I think this bricolage is part of Deleuze's sincere effort to kind of provide a linguistic or conceptual analogue for Bacon's body of work. Heads, portraits, coupled figures, triptychs, landscapes, crucifixions and so on. But I think the apparatus has become a somewhat dangerously diminished currency and as such risks concealing about as much as it reveals about Bacon's work. And for me personally, I think it's time to introduce some disruptive and disfiguring challenges to it. And this paper, I think, is in part an effort to do just that. The other aim of my paper is a desire to bring Nancy's philosophy into contact with Bacon, uh, specifically around the issue of disfiguration, um, the ontology of bodies and the necessary reinvention of realism. And I think this is best introduced by reminding ourselves of the artist's own words back in an interview with Sylvester from 1984 for the BBC, um, which I'll just show a very brief clip of. Okay. Now, in the collected Sylvester interviews, together with countless other interviews given by Bacon, he repeatedly insists upon um, anti-illustrational intentions and his desire for his work to reach extreme points of realism through this, what he calls, reinvented practice of realist painting. In a much earlier interview with Sylvester from 66, while describing his work as anti-illustrational, Bacon reflects upon the figurative and illustrational achievements in Velazquez, who was obviously an important painter for him. And he says the following, in Velazquez, it's a very, very extraordinary thing that he has been able to keep it so near to what we call illustration, and at the same time, so deeply unlock the greatest and deepest things that man can feel. But of course, so many things have happened since Velasquez that the situation has become much more involved and much more difficult for very many reasons. And one of them, of course, which has never actually been worked out, is why photography has altered completely this whole thing of figurative painting and totally altered it. Now, Bacon here, by contrasting the recording function undertaken by Velasquez, which is the function overtaken by photography, that he says also remains conditioned by certain religious possibilities. So by contrasting that with the contemporary situation, i.e. 
the, the situation that he found himself in, in the aftermath of Nietzsche's death of God, whereby we have come to the realization that we're accidents, that we're groundless. And we have to, he argues, quote, play the game without reason now. And in such circumstances, it's now a matter of struggling against the traps of becoming a merely illustrational painter, producing irrelevant and derivative work. And as we just heard him say, the task is this task of reinventing realism. And at the moment in the 66 interview with Sylvester where Bacon is reflecting on exactly this point, and, you know, and we see him struggling again and again to try and articulate these points. He, said, he continually says it's a very difficult thing to articulate. Um, he starts talking about introducing and surveying something he calls a graph into the marks that he's making uh, when he's painting. And I think it's worth uh, looking more closely at what Bacon actually says here. The marks are made and you survey the thing like you would a sort of graph. And you see within this graph the possibilities of all types of fact being planted. And this is a difficult thing and I'm expressing it badly. But you see, for instance, if you think of a portrait, you maybe at one time have put the mouth somewhere, but you suddenly see through this graph that the mouth could go right across the face. And in a way, you would love to be able, in a portrait, to make a Sahara of the appearance, to make it so like, yet seeming to have the distances of the Sahara. And I think this particular moment in the interviews provides Deleuze with an absolutely crucial conceptual apparatus for understanding Bacon's practice of disfiguration. Because Deleuze presents the introduction, the introduction into the visual realm of what he terms the diagram as a kind of manual catastrophe, the introduction of the chaos of accidental marks, random marks, manual traits, in order to disrupt and disfigure the illustrational or representational coordinates that always already haunt and occupy the canvas before Bacon even starts. Now, I think um, it's very significant, though, uh, that Bacon introduces, uh, Deleuze introduces this idea of the diagram because it goes on to provide him um, with a very clear placing of where Bacon stands. Uh, within contemporary art and he talks about Bacon's status as this having this kind of third way between optical um, abstraction and manual or action painting. Um, but I think if we look in the original interviews with Sylvester we see that Bacon specifically uses the word graph and not diagram. In the 1976 French translation of those interviews um, the translators, which was uh, Lyris and Pepiat, uh, they translate graph as sort the diagram, where Bacon's original term could perhaps, I think more accurately, been translated as le graph. It's as if they've treated le graph and diagram as synonyms. But are they? The French translation of the interviews would have been the one read by Deleuze in preparation for, and indeed fair, used fairly extensively throughout the logic of sensation. And indeed, in his original 1981 French text, Deleuze writes um, about uh, Bacon appel un diagram. Now, when it came to be subsequently translated into English in 2003, the translator Daniel Smith translates this line as, this is what Bacon calls a graph or a diagram. So Smith is at pains here to indicate that the use of the term diagram by Deleuze actually relates, relates much more specifically to the term graph in Bacon. I think it's just worth here just quickly indicating the meaning and etymology of the two terms. So a graph is a diagram. Um, it's a diagram consisting of lines used to show the relationship between two things, often to show uh, changes in some quantity. It's a kind of instrument for recording change. Um, and it's a shortening of the term graphic formula. And it's from the Greek graphos, meaning writing, from graph to write, to express by written characters. Whereas diagram, from the Greek diagramma, uh, is a geometric figure which is marked out by lines 
um, diagraphene to mark out bylines delineate from dia, meaning across, between, through, and graphene, meaning to write, mark, draw. Um, unlike the term illustration, diagram is used as a collective term standing for a whole class of technical genres, including graphs. And I think the slippage here is not insignificant, as well as the graph that Bacon proposes to survey at certain moments in painting. There are, in fact, multiple forms of graph in Bacon's work. There are photographs, there are radiographs, there are mimeographs, psychographs, uh, rather than diagrams as such. And each one of those graphs would need their own subsequent study, I think. From a careful reflection on Bacon's actual words here, it seems as if the survey of the graph involves a very precise, careful and deliberate intention regarding the fragmentary spacing of marks to make something have the space of Sahara and a deliberate and suggestive disfiguration, a moving or stretching of the mouth from one point to another. And I think we need to understand the point being made here uh, through the use of the term graph, a specific type of diagram, to use to measure and mark points of difference and change rather than a diagram per se. I think uh, there's an irony that uh, on this point, at the beginning of Deleuze's chapter on the diagram, he begins the chapter by saying that we don't listen closely enough to what painters actually have to say. So I think there's a need to look again more closely at Bacon's methodology of fragmentation and disfiguration and the, this introduction of the graph. And it's at this point I want to bring this articulation of extreme points of realism into contact with Nancy's philosophical work uh, corpus in this uh, work uh, published um, in the early 90s by Nancy called Corpus. Um, and his idea of the body as fragmentary touching of sense. Um, Bacon is actually directly cited and discussed by uh, Nancy, uh, albeit briefly, throughout a number of his philosophical texts, which include an essay devoted to Bacon called Disfiguration, which was first published in France in 2006, translated into English in 2014, um, in, in a book uh, joint authored with Federico Ferrari called Being Nude. Um, but there are also um, reflections on Bacon in his essay on painting and presence in the collection The Birth to Presence, along with his books Portrait, The Muses, a finite thinking and corpus itself. And I think the abbreviated observations in his essay directly on Bacon are actually enriched by being first brought into contact with a broader grasp of the major elements of his ontological claims. And they are also significantly expanded by having a grasp of Nancy's philosophy of fragmentary bodies. Throughout all of Nancy's philosophical work, there is an overarching concern with the question of what is meaning or how is meaning? How is it that the world and we ourselves as part of that world are open and available as meaning? Broadly understood, Nancy argues that meaning is inextricably bound up with a collective we world, a shared space of being with. And this world is never a single flat, homogenous and totalized matter uh, because such myths have ended. Rather, it's something whose sense is shared out or divided between different subjects as things, between one thing and another. Sense only exists then as a, this vast circulation of meanings, insofar as the plural network of meaning always involves the coexistence of identity and difference, alterity and plurality. And the circulation of meaning goes in all directions at once without any progression or linear paths, bit by bit, case by case, essentially accidental, but singular and plural in its very principle. It does not have a final fulfillment any more than it has a point of origin. Now in this ontology, there is what Nancy calls a contiguity of things rather than continuity. There is a plural fragmentary touching of bodies but no fixed unity. 
In place of a single ordered whole, there is only touching or contact. It goes from one being to another. All being is in touch with all being. With that law of touching being what Monty calls separation rather than mixing. So these heterogeneous surfaces in being touch each other, in making sense of one another, um, but there's no uh, actual penetration or mixing. Um, there's no neutral intermediate milieu where one thing disappears and it's subsumed into another. In touching, there remains uh, a, a kind of tension of separation, a spacing between things. So meanings are points of extreme contiguity or contact between uh, the heterogeneous bodily surfaces. And human beings, he argues, are the product of such difference, of such heterogeneous borders. So by virtue of being a body that differs from other bodies, even as bodies are in contact, or contiguous with other bodies. Indeed, as Nancy argues, the discrete singularity of a human body itself is constituted and made up of plural touches of heterogeneous surfaces. Uh, a body itself is traversed by multiple contiguous differences, and it must be seen as a what he calls a corpus of traits rather than a single fixed entity. So my body your body is a corpus of multiple contiguous elements, traits, energies, forces, parts, channels, openings, clefts, spasms, rhythms, functions, and so on. Quick note here that corpus comes from the Latin corpus, meaning the body, but it also means a, a collection of writing, a body of work, the main body. Uh, it, it can be used for the names of body parts. Um, and it has a number of synonyms, which I think are useful to bear in mind. It means a catalogue, a collection, a compilation, an aggregation. Now, for Nancy, the body is made up of these series of these limits, this corpus of limits. Uh, the body is finite, exposed and touched at these limits of itself. It's ceaselessly exposed at these limits these repetitions of its plural contacts. And the singular body is always then a catalogue, or what he terms a corpus, of contiguous traits, rather than a, def a definable and fixed unity. A singularity is always such a body, and all bodies are singularities, the bodies that, of their states, their movements, and so on. And all ontology is ultimately an ontology of such bodies, of every body, whether they're inanimate bodies, animate bodies, sentient, speaking, thinking, having weight, and so on. And above all else, uh, for um, and this is uh, the, the, one of the tricky concepts, but a very important one. Um, above all else, for Nancy, the body, uh, what it really means to be a body is to, for, for a body to be outside itself. It's always outside itself by being next to, against, nearby, with an other body, from body to body. And his fundamental ontology rejects the integral fixed unity of classical theology and, philo and philosophy and advocates for a notion of disintegrated bodies marked by multiple fragmented alterities and this reinterpretation of the body as corpus. And importantly, um, this term that he uses, the body as being excripted, it's a kind of made up term that Nancy uses here, being excripted or being excribed. Um, now that latter idea is an important one which I'll return to in a moment. So Corpus thinks the body is disintegrated and is reconceptualized as a series of contiguous terms or states. He rejects the idea of le corps, the body, uh, and replaces it with the idea of corpus, a catalogue of singularities that evokes bodies without essentializing them. So what it means to be a body is indicated through a plurality of catalogues or corpi whose singular terms may be repeated from one list to the next, but always with new additions and in different combinations. So as he writes in corpus, the body 
he writes, quote, is a skin variously folded, refolded, unfolded, multiplied, invaginated, orificed, evasive, invaded, stretched, relaxed, excited, distressed, tied, untied. Now, as I said before, in, in corpus, the body is described as its process of being excribed, a process where the body repeatedly and ceaselessly places itself outside itself at its own limits, at the point of it becoming its own unity, its own integrity. And the body is disfigured in this process of being excribed. Being excribed means that bodies take place at the limit qua limit at the external borders, the fractures and intersections of anything foreign to it in the continuum of sense. And it's worth here mentioning um, that partly one of the reasons why um, I personally, this is kind of a personal thing really, um, started to read Nancy, is that one of his most impressive for me um, essays on this process of bodily inscription came about through Nancy's reflections on the process of his heart failing and needing a heart transplant and then the process of having a heart transplant and taking the drugs necessary uh, uh, you know to suppress his immune system ended up getting a rare form of cancer so you know and and Nancy reflecting on the fact that you know that, that what he had taken to be his body was in fact there were huge parts of his body that had formerly been invisible uh, that were now visible and tangible uh, and this sense that these elements of his body were like kind of foreign intruders not not least the the heart of the other that he received but his own damaged heart he, you know I think Nancy sort of said to, to what extent could I have ever sort of said that it was my heart to start with um, uh, so there's a, it's a very short essay published actually as a, an, an appendix in this book um, that d describes this process of the body putting itself outside of itself in very personal terms. Um, and that was the reason, you know, uh, because during the pandemic, um, I experienced heart failure myself. Um, and you know, reading that essay by Nancy was kind of like the gateway uh, to, to his philosophy for me. So I think this Nancy and thinking of touch and the body and inscription gives us some basic terms of a reinvented form of realism, um, one that's irreducible to any traditional forms of realism or the logic of representation. Uh, and it does so in this movement of inscription. Sense only exists in the separation touch of sense and impenetrable matter. And the body is the site of that touch that makes sense. However, as a material being at the same time, it's outside of all sense. Excription describes the relationship between exteriority or separation, which is maintained between impenetrable matter and bodily sense of how the body operating at multiple limits is always alienated from itself. So every body is constituted by multiple limits being excrypted. Every body divides and relates to itself and to others along multiple shifting borders. So rather than defining the fixed identity of a timeless self, a corpus records those multiple fault lines that aggregate into a process of temporal selving and the body itself never stops selving. And for Nancy, we need a corpus, we need a catalogue instead of a logic to account for that process of selving. Uh, as he writes, we need the enumeration of an empirical logos, but without transcendental reason, a list of gleanings in random order and completeness, an ongoing stammer of bits and pieces. As he says, a body is a collection of pieces, bits, members, zones, states, functions, heads, hands and cartilage, burnings, smoothnesses, spurts, sleep, digestion, goosebumps, excitation, breathing, digesting, reproducing, mending, 
saliva, synovia, twists, cramps and beauty spots. It's a collection of collections, a corpus corporum, whose unity remains a question for itself. Now, interesting, just prior to the clip that I showed at the beginning um, of the interview with Sylvester, Sylvester proposes to Bacon, you know, when Bacon's talking about sort of trying to capture the pulsations, the living presence of a human body and so forth, he puts to Bacon that, well, you know, I was recently talking to Giacometti, and Giacometti, I think, captured it well. And he says that Giacometti expressed to him that what he's trying to capture is the gaze of another person. And Bacon says, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not enough. Because he says that the face, as well as the body, is made up of many, infinitely many more parts than just the gaze. And he says that the reinvented form of realism that he's trying to reach uh, isn't just concerned with the gaze, it's concerned with the collection of all of the different bodily parts. And I think there's a, a kind of deep resonance here with, um, with uh, 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 Nancy with regard to, to, to corpus. And I want to finish now by moving on to uh, the philosophy of the body that informs Nancy's short text on Bacon, which, as I said, is called Disfiguration. Um, and their text focuses on this painting, which is Study for a Nude, 1951, which they credit as one of Bacon's first nudes. Um, they begin by discussing the revolutionary photographic work of Mybridge, from which this work is obviously derived. Um, you know, it relates to um, a, a photograph from a series of photographs uh, Mybridge took of a man lifting a rock. Um, and they argue that it's largely thanks to Mybridge's work uh, that a new form of realism emerged itself, where, quote, the enigmatic relation that exists between figure and time, that is, the problem of a figure's movement and the way in which it is in motion, becomes fundamental and evident. So they credit Mybridge, first of all, with reinventing uh, realism through a particular type of photography. But then they argue that it's probably only with Bacon was Mybridge's heritage really taken up, thought all the way through, and thereby again reinvented. They say with Bacon it's as if in moving this figure has become dissociated from itself, leaving only a trace of itself at each point in the space being traversed. The figure is reduced, alienated, which is the word they used here instead of as excripted, is alienation from itself. Two, as Bacon describes it, a trace of human presence, as if human presence always only gives itself as a trace or collection of traces. And it's just worth noting here that if you look for this painting in the early catalogue, not the most recent, but the early catalogue resume by Ronald Alley, Alley um, notes there that this painting itself, he said, could be uh, seen to serve to illustrate the following words by Bacon. He used the term illustrate. This is an illustration, he says, of these words. I would like my pictures to look as if a human body had passed between them like a snail leaving a trail of the human presence and memory trace of past events as the snail leaves its slime. I think the whole process of this sort of elliptical form is dependent on the execution of detail and how shapes are remade or put slightly out of focus to bring in their memory traces. For Bacon, it's no longer possible, by contrast to Mybridge, to put this figure in focus, to somehow freeze it in motion and give a figure in movement as a unified and integral form. So liberated from cognitive or illustrative obligations previously explored and developed, the figure now moves differently within the space of the painting. And as we saw right at the beginning, there's no longer what he calls any natural realism to be legitimately pursued in painting. The game, he says, has to be deepened. 
And for Nancy and Ferrari, in this and other early figurative paintings, Bacon is assuming and then thoroughly reinventing the photographic realism of Mybridge, right? reconceiving in painting the figure's relationship with time. The figure in the painting is described as alienating itself from its natural photographic form as it moves through space, beginning to move through a different space and set of temporal relations in the painting, leaving a series of traces. The figure in confronting time is painted as reduced, stretched, spaced, thickened and distorted into a series or collection of traces that are simultaneously incohate coagulated and thick. If one looks at the original photograph from which this is derived in Mybridge, the figure is, let's say, in no way as thick as this figure. And I think one clue, which saw David Sylvester, um, when he's reflecting on this particular painting in his book, Looking Back at Francis Bacon, I think uh, gets on the nose here is he says um, that this figural thickness, which one sees in this painting, but many others, um, not only do maybe they derive from the Mybridge photograph directly, um, but may in fact consist of Bacon developing the traces of two coagulating wrestling figures in Mybridge. Um, and as Sylvester points out, Bacon once said to him, actually, I've often used the wrestlers in painting single figures because I find that two figures together have a thickness that give overtone to which the photographs of single figures don't have. Now, as Nancy observes, Bacon's painting is figurative insofar as it now shows the movement that a body completes in order to become a figure. The process through which he says a naked body in movement succeeds in shattering the cliches of the human figure and exposes it to the extremes of time, to birth and to death. The inscription and distortion of the figure into a collection of painted um, bodily traces um, is, is, is ceaselessly and infinitely um, repeated um, to give this sense of naked reality trying to show itself, uh, to try and trap the naked into giving itself over as a figure confronting time. As they write, it's really the material of the nude, of the body, which is no more human than animal, that more forcefully than any other subject allows the disfiguration of figuration in order to make a figure and its movement appear. The pictorial gesture is skinned, stripped of all narrative, anatomical, classificatory, semantic, symbolic, or sanctifying intent. What appears here is the simple presence of the real, its figural side, the nudity of a body. And in this nudity, I think a reinvented form of realism emerges, which I think resonates deeply with Bacon. Where the real is not something fixed and available, out of time, to then be rendered into a merely representational, illustrational form, rather the real is realised in painting by being forced into becoming a figure exposed to the sense of finitude and in the process of always becoming spaced into singularities and undone. And I think it's this extreme effort at realising a reinvented realism that such a figure is always in the process of disfiguring itself, of rupturing, distorting, undoing itself as a fixed entity, illuminated as illustration. Turning itself from a fixed essence into a series of incohate traces pulled apart, folded and distorted by time. So I think the introduction of what Bacon calls the graph here is being used to try and explain how he's exactly and precisely manipulating and distorting such fixities by a process of spacing, folding and tracing. And I think this is a very different claim uh, from Deleuze's catastrophic inter interpretation of diagrammatic practice in Bacon namely the 
injection of manual accidents and chance. Um, now, Nancy's understanding of Bacon's disfiguration speaks to a much greater form of deliberation, I think, um, where Bacon's using words like the execution of detail um, and so on, within the rep repetitive experimental acts of reduction, folding and distortion. So I think Bacon is carefully propagating and breeding visual disturbances and movements within the figure by consistently exceeding, rupturing and excripting its so-called proper fixity and spatio-temporal continuity by means other than the chaotic throwing of the levers or releasing the catastrophe by chance and accident. There are, I think, definitely moments in Bacon that we can see where you know, he, he has thrown paint at the canvas and he describes it till Sylvester like you know that there, there, there are these moments where to finish a painting he will just throw paint in it and it's remarkably lands exactly you know uh, perfect for him um, but I, I think to extend those kind of manual moments of chaos and um, accident to the way in which the figure is being distorted I think is to go too far um, I think there's something much more deliberate and careful going on in Bacon that I think Nancy's account actually um, gets us clo closer to. Um, so I think um, I'll just... How, how much time have I got then? Five minutes, okay. Um, okay, well I will, will read the following quote from Being Nude to, to sort of finish up. So in Bacon, then, this is the nudity of an art in which the true nature of all realist art emerges. The real is never simply a given. The real is realised. Painting is precisely the practice at the heart of which the real realises itself by becoming a figure exposed to time. And because of this exposure to the excesses of time, each figure is always in the process of disfiguring itself. The restlessness of time sets a tremble, the immobility that reigns in the mirror of representation and propagates movement there. After this shock, after this rupture of spatio-temporal continuity, one can use the term figure only for this form of life that stripped of everything, accepts the suspension of its proper fixity its impassibility and exposes itself to the continual disfiguration of itself, to the continual exceeding of the body in relation to the self that is the body's self. Only then can the act and the naked body become figure and realise themselves. So I think in conclusion, what I want to sort of conclude by saying today is that um, what Nancy's work is suggesting more broadly is the extent to which Bacon's paintings can be approached as a corpus, a painted catalogue of the body's inflections, the body's openings, penetrations, tensions, swerves, contractions. And this understanding of how the body extrides itself repeatedly into multifarious touching fragments of a corpus bring us right back, I think, to um, Bacon's struggles to repeatedly articulate um, how he is attempting to paint extreme points of realism. His reinvention of body realism in a post-Nietzschean era. Here, the graph that he talks about when attempting to resist, challenge and overcome illustration becomes a repeatedly scripted operation on the painted body the shifting parts, organs, bones, into adjacent touching spaces, into distorted and folded parts, rather than the now familiar interpretation is them as the, be the result of blunt interjections of catastrophe and chance. It's the step by step building, I would suggest, as a corpus that is Bacon's new realism. The mark by mark, the alienation distortion of moments of touch of sense rather than its complete manual scrambling. 
And it's to finish with uh, Monty's own words from Corpus. So that this new realism consists, as he says, of a whole corpus of images stretched from body to body, made up of local colours and shadows, fragments, grains, areolas, lumals, nails, hair, tendons, skulls, ribs, pelvises, bellies, metuses, foams, tears, teeth, droolings, slits, blocks, tongues, sweat, liquors, veins, pains and joys, and me, and you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Darren. That was uh, fantastic, uh, extremely rich. Um, I, for one, uh, didn't even know that Nancy had written anything on Bacon. Um, so that's yeah, very, very revealing indeed. Um, questions? All right. Yep. Uh, you can also have a historical responsibility after becoming a film and photography, as if there's some sort of rupture, uh, historical rupture, and now painting is meant to do something different. And I understand that claim, but I also, I'm also a bit skeptical of it because I'm thinking that even in those kinds of visual art, photography, and film, in order to I think there are two things here. I think that there's one which is to stay within the the, the realm of, of his relationship to film and photography, and you know painting in the advent of that and, and, and subsequent to that. And I think you know as as I, I've tried to suggest is that that sort of Nancy himself thinks that photography and cinema and so forth are themselves a reinvention of of realism. And I think that despite the fact that Bacon himself never sort of um, spoke about it in those terms, there's certainly in terms of his practice uh, evidence that he consistently and continually utilised photography and manipulated uh, photographs uh, as part of his practice. Um, you know, this idea, I, I, I mean, I, some of you may have looked at some of the recent stuff that's been published on Bacon in relation to photography. There's examples of where um, Bacon has taken a photograph, for example, and one of the ways in which he's distorting further that photograph is he's folding it almost origami-like into a kind of 3D sculpture, which you can, with some of the existing photographs from the studio, you can actually follow the lines of the folds and reconstruct these little folded origami photographs, which are, you know, ends up distorting the photographic realism even further. So I, th I, I take the point that photography itself is a form of reinscribing and a defamation of, of realism. You know, my, my you know, the whole original intention was that we'd never seen the way in which animals were able to sort of move. And it was only by kind of freezing them in series that we were able to be revealed 
Uh, so realism was disrupted in this sense from flow to freezing. Um, but my second point, I think, um, one of which I try to touch upon a little here, is I think the burden that Bacon is also expressing um, for the reason to necessity to reinvent realism is, of course, the, th th this idea that we're in a post Nietzschean era, that painting prior to this had been governed, even as he says Velasquez and Rembrandt, we can still see the extent to which their, their realism is subject to kind of religious possibilities, religious grounding. And, and for Bacon, there's, that's simply not available as paintings anymore. So that's, I think, the, the second reason which supplements, I think, the point you're making about uh, photography. It's not simply in response to photography, but he's, it's also in response to, you know, this this sort of um, post-Nietzschean um, context in which he finds himself, which he says, you know, the different field changes the function now of painting. One of the things that always amuses me before the clip that I showed of Bacon talking there, uh, literally just the, the point leading up to it is where Bacon is expressing himself in terms of trying to capture pulsations, the pulsations of the person. And he goes on at length <laughs> uh, talking about pulsations and then he pauses and he looks at Sylvester and says, am I just talking bollocks? <laughs> always really amuses me and there must have been multiple moments I think in those interviews with Sylvester where the struggle Bacon has to articulate himself sort of I think he thinks sometimes I'm am I am I slipping into nonsense <laughs> okay. um. On exposure, yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, like I, I try to express that the exposure to the surfaces of difference isn't just, I mean, it does exist as sort of like, you know, one body against another, um, you know, one body against the altar, although it is a term that, um, that Nancy resists this emphasis of like the alterity of the other, you know, like in Levinas and, and others that sort of other post-structures think is prioritized alterity of the other. Um, you know, he, he is talking about sort of the, you know, one body against another, and it, it can be inanimate bodies. And, you know, he describes this as like the surfaces of the tree touching the ground and the surfaces of rain touching the tree uh, and so forth. So it, it, it extends, it's the ontology of all being touching all beings. Um, but I, I think what I try to emphasize is the extent to which he's saying that within, because you know, he starts off this book by, by fundamentally saying what, what, is, what is really challenging and trying to deconstruct is essentially a very Christian concept. Um, and it's this, con this concept which he reduces to the, uh, the idea of when, when we say, this is my body. And he's sort of trying to undo this sort of sense of like, ownership and uh, idea that our body is a kind of unified thing. So he's inflecting difference into the body itself. It's not just bodies against bodies. It's the way in which the body itself is traversed by infinite processes of, 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 of contacts between organs and between sort of, you know, um, you know, its porous qualities, the sense in which, as, as he discovered, you know, with immunosuppressants, when he started taking immunosuppressants, that his body was already inhabited by long dormant uh, viruses that sort of, you know, had been there for years. And, 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 you know, so the body is traversed by all of these kind of points of, of touch. So it's not simply a question of body to body touch, you know, um, as, as that may be understood. Uh, Vanessa.
first comes to mind is, is you know, is um, this may not answer your question, but um, he's asked why he repeatedly paints himself um, by Sylvester, and I think he somewhat disingenuously, not entirely, but disingenuously says, well, simply because the people, you know, I paint are all dead. They've died. And I'm just left with, well, he, you know, he describes, he, he describes himself somewhat, um, you know, sort of insulting me, doesn't he? Sort of says like, you know, I'm just left with my old pudding face to, to paint over and over again. Um, but as far as it, remarks, uh, uh, you know, that are, are sort of, you know, rather kind of um, derogatory about himself. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head any remarks where he's reflecting more personally upon his own body. Uh, but to cross it in the painting, he does uh, repeatedly. Yes. <laughs> It's the latter for me. However, there are moments in Corpus, there are moments in The Intruder, there are moments throughout Nancy's work where he will step back and say this is a very difficult thing to think and to say. I mean, at one point he says, you know, this may, in here, quite beautiful passage in which he says, you know, this makes my mouth go dry even trying to, to speak this, where he says that we are at once both uh, an expression of joy and cancer. You know, we are that. You know, that and he, 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 there's another passage where he talks about that the idea of thinking the body as this process of excription means that we have to think that we are always being excripted to the corpse, to death. Um, but, but always, e even in the acknowledgement, th these are very difficult things to say. And, and very difficult things to think and, and may in fact be traumatizing. I think Nancy tries to return us quite dispassionately to the fact that he's simply describing, for want of a better term, the brutality of fact. It simply is how, how the body is, rather than attaching any kind of um, ennui or, or, or trauma, as you say, to it. It may be traumatic to think it. I mean, you know, Nietzsche repeatedly says that, you know, his thinking is traumatic, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the most difficult thinking. It's going to cause huge amounts of pain um, to, to think through. You know, Nietzsche's always banging on about that. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think it's similar for Nancy. So I think it's the latter. Okay, so I think we have time for just one more question. 
think, I think, again, my answer, it may not fully answer your question, but the way I'm, I, I would think about it is that inscribing corpi is clearly for Nazi um, something which has to be kind of repeatedly done and reassembled in, in, in different orders. So it may be the same terms, but it's always with additions um, and in, in different orders and different sort of sense of emphasis and priorities, simply because I think, as you say, that there's a danger in inscribing them um, that, 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 they, that they're that they in danger of becoming, through a dialectic, kind of something fixed. Um, and it, it's like, for me, it may not be the right way to think about it, um, but I, I kind of think of inscription and excription, the relationship, as, the, as, as, as not dissimilar to Levinas's idea of the said and the saying. So, you know, in, 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 in trying to speak of this ethical relationship to absolute alterity, the absolute responsibility I have to the other, in saying it, it becomes kind of solidified into a said, um, which betrays the, the, the ethical relationship. So that ethical relationship must be re-said. This, you know, it has to be said again through an act of saying that disrupts that, that kind of dialectic where it would become kind of subsumed and, and, and fixed. And I think that inscription and excription, um, you know, kind of uh, is analogous to that process. It, it has to be continually disrupted, that, that sort of process by which it becomes sort of a subsuming movement that would give us a kind of form of unity. Um, okay, excellent. If we could just uh, thank Darren one final time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Darren. Thank mm -hmm. you.